there's a chapter, I don't know what it is, I'll have to look it up, in your book called Social Behavior. And um, I think I've already expressed the fact that I, I don't think that's an adequate description. So um, what I want to do today is to discuss with you sociality, why it's significant, sufficiently significant that I think it merits more discussion. I want to use sociality as an example of a adaptation that's evolved that very much changes the um, potential for success of a, of a species. What, what evolutionary biologists usually say is that it puts a species in a new adaptive environment. But by that they mean that certain adaptations are so profound that the forces of selection that then act on the species are different than the ones that acted on the species before it, ha it evolved this adaptation. A third reason I want to talk to you about this is because uh, we are members of a social species and there's a great deal of misunderstanding about what the significance of that is and frankly ignorance. I don't know how else to, to put it. Um, people just don't understand apparently or don't know. And And I think on this last point, it strikes me that so much of um, the human experience is a quest for knowledge about self that um, it's perhaps a little alarming and telling that there hasn't been more focus on the, the meaning of sociality. And what I would say is that although we speak of wanting to understand self. We are afraid of what the answers to that question are so profoundly that when we are offered the opportunity to see those, we will recoil from it. Ooh, that has a nice, right, right, those, oh, it's on tape. I can use that in my book. Okay, let's talk sociality. The notion that individuals will live together in an organized way doesn't seem that radical. We know that cells have done this. We know that whether through parasitism or feeding, it's not clear, that our own cells are a product of some interplay between what were once separate organisms. We know that indi these individual organisms or cells, at some time when the atmosphere filled with a ton of oxygen, um, began to associate and eventually they began to differentiate so that you could have tissues form and those tissues could eventually become organs. And so in a sense, and in fact a literal sense, organisms including us are the product of some sort of social interaction between what were once free living organisms. And as I think I've mentioned in previous lectures, this um, makes the kind of obscure philosophical question about whether a human is one thing or many things actually a legitimate question. Um, I remember, I must have been five or six, and I'm guessing you guys did something like this. I remember asking my mother when I realized I was sloughing off skin cells and I was taught how these things were replaced, and I said, well, if if all my cells are constantly re being replaced, does that mean when I'm older, I'm no longer physically the same person I was? Am I the same person or am I constantly becoming different people? Yeah, that's a really good question that nobody can find the answer to, right? Before we go down that road, where I start to talk to you about the very intricacies of sociality, Let's look at solitary species. As mammals who belong to a social species, 
We are encumbered by the inability to truly understand what a solitary species means. We talk of people who are hermits, and we talk about the need to be by ourselves, but none of those really correspond to what it means to be a solitary species. Even when we look at animals we think we understand who are solitary, and by, now, by, by this I'm mostly referring to mammals, we frequently find they're not solitary at all. A good example of this are essentially all the cats. People make a big deal about how cats, domestic cats, are very um, isolated and so forth, but actually there are no members of the cat family that do not have some degree of social behavior. Their social interactions may occur on a larger scale than what we think of other sorts of social species, but they, they are very definitely social. So when we start talking about solitary species, we're literally talking about a species that stays away from other members of its, of its kind with two exceptions. And those two exceptions are to mate and then for the female to reproduce. A third type of interaction that's possible is that they may actually compete. Because members of the same species use the same resource, it wouldn't be surprising then that they could be their own worst competitors. And what we would expect is that if that were the case, selection would be extremely strong so that it would favor differences that keep them apart. And in fact, that strong selection from competition within a species is a prime mechanism. I would argue it's the main mechanism that leads Many evolutionary biologists would disagree <coughs> with that statement I just made. So be aware that that was a point of scientific opinion, not fact. But the reason I say it is that we look at the instances where there's greatest species diversity, they are in those environments in which we would see the greatest opportunities for competition within a species. So I, I feel like I'm on solid ground with that statement, despite opinions to the contrary. If you're solitary, what adaptations do you need to have to successfully reproduce? Well, I suppose you could take your gamete. Let's assume, we're assuming now that we're locked into the two sex system and we're not doing asexual reproduction. If there's asexual reproduction, you don't need anybody. And really, the kids are, just get the hell out of here. You, I split, I butted, go on your own way. Stay out of my turf, stay off my turf, kid. But as soon as we have sexual selection, there's a whole host of problems. Uh, problems. We need to get those gametes together. One way to do this would produce so many gametes and just spread them out <laughs> everywhere and hope that one, and this would be a male strategy, eventually reaches a female, right? If it doesn't, we could have a mechanism for self-pollination, which would be asexual using sex to have asexual reproduction. Man, what's the point? Well, I the point, suppose the point is that if all else fails, at least you're able to continue with a lousy set of genes you've got. We see the ability to self in lots of plants, and many of those plant species do produce a lot of pollen. What I like to call sex run riot, ar arguably, what is, what is from my perspective, one of the worst adaptations ever in the history of biology, but unfortunately, apparently, is extremely successful, would be that strategy that many plants have of just producing hundreds and hundreds and thousands of gametes and sticking them everywhere. You will know this as the spring pollen explosion, which causes endless allergies among humans and other mammals who don't appreciate having your 
gametes going up your nose. Somebody else's gametes stuck in your nose. I don't like it. There are animals that use a strategy not that much far, farther removed. If you look at fish uh, fertilization, there's a lot of spraying of gametes around. If we look at some small invertebrates, there are invertebrates that do the same thing. They basically put little packages of sperm all over the place. But the problem with those strategies is there's no guarantee. And so with fish, with some of these invertebrates, they invariably have evolved behaviors to guide females to sperm. Now, at this point, I should be doing an in-class sex demonstration. Oh my God, why don't I do an in-class sex demonstration? So that the participating students for the rest of their lives can Professor made us demonstrate sex in class. Now, you don't have to have the details. So this is what I need to demonstrate this. I need a male, a female, and the male needs to have a pencil. And it's not for what you think. Now, when you tell this story at a dinner party, it's going to look better if you say you volunteered. Are you ready? Do I have two volunteers? Oh, really? Oh, really? Like, I've never looked at Twitter. I, like, I don't know what's going on. I was talking to my son yesterday about the whole online dating thing. Okay. You have the misfortune of being in the front. Would you mind helping me with this demonstration? You have the misfortune of being on the, on the end row. Do you have a pencil? Will you come on up? Actually, no physical contact can be made. That's what's so interesting about it. Just wait, just wait. This is the most valuable thing in your life. I have an old Nerf football I usually use for these demonstrations, but I forgot it. Okay, this is your sperm football. In one of the most primitive, a group of insects that are so primitive it's not clear if they're insects, uh, the silverfish, the male will find a wall. Here, here's your wall. Sorry, Kelly. I knew you had a chance to be an inanimate object and I denied it to you. There's your wall. Okay. You deposit your sperm, your spermatophore, your sperm football on the ground. Then you go in search of a female. When you find a female, I said there was, come on, come on, come on. We've got to get this, 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 your evolutionary life here at risk. Come on over, come on over. You need to coax the female to your sperm. Oh, I forgot one thing, sorry. And the thing I forgot, which I'm not going to make you act out, but let me say that when I do the HBO special, they're acting it out. The male takes a piece of silk and puts the, sper the spermatophore right underneath. Now, silk has two possible origins. Uh, labial silk, which comes from glands in the mouth, or anal silk, which comes from glands in the anus. Which do the silverfish have? Come on, it's from the anus. You know it's gonna be better television if you gotta, the males have to twerk their silk down onto the ground. Okay. The male has to coax the female. And by coax, I mean badger, push, there's not a lot of uh, silverfish talking. So coax the female over towards the, 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 the yeah, 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 that's it. Okay. He will, you, whoa, 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 don't get, don't, right, right here, right here. Now, you use your antenna, oh, I forgot, you need an antenna too here, and I have one for you. Use your antenna to match her antenna. So bang your antennae. It's a special time. You guys are laughing, but you have no idea what a special time that is. If the female, and the female will try to get away during this process, which is a part of judging the significance of the female. If she is successful, the male goes on, I believe, goes on the other side. The female walks towards the male with her, her 
antenna held high. So walk towards the male, keep walking. Oh, but she feels the strand. And when she feels the strand with her, and this is a party game, I think that's a lot better than past the oranges. With her rear, she reaches down, picks up the spurred football, and <laughs> you didn't like that? There you go. Thank you very much. This is indirect sperm transfer in uh, silverfish. Okay. Trust me, at some point in your life, I, just bought, I could have bought you free meals for the rest of your life in class sex demonstration. I, and, and, yet, and yet, I'm not on the hated conservatives list. Uh, what, does, what do I have to do to try to get conservatives to hate me if I can't do it with in-class sex demonstrations? Okay, what does this show? Two things. One, it's more efficient for the male because he knows that his sperm gets to a female. Two, it's better for the female because she knows that the sperm she's getting isn't from just some random loser. Hey, but this guy put the moves on her and that was okay, right? Additionally, there is the problem. The whole reason we have the sperm football in the first place is that it protects the sperm and semen so it doesn't dry out. And especially with small organisms, if you're on land, that's a big issue. Why isn't the simple handoff the way most species reproduce on land? In other words, if there's a perfectly acceptable way for doing sperm transfer, why is it that we had other forms of sperm transfer evolve? And they routinely evolve towards the same thing, which is direct fertilization, by which I mean you get a tube, it goes into a socket, and there you go, you have a current. I'm going to digress for a moment. Some of you will have noticed, hmm, did I, I can't remember, maybe I didn't post it to this class. A few weeks ago, I pointed out that my, my months of problems in trying to get my video equipment to work was because Nikon uses a mini USB a USB-B connector that has eight pins instead of the standard five pin. And so I've been trying to do the connection for five pin. This is my insight. One, uni universal serial bus, there's nothing even remotely universal about them. And two, does life really have to be this way? One thing jabbing into another. Sex is the reason our technology is gonna fail. And having cables that are nothing more than some sort of lame-ass excuse for sex is destroying the world, and it destroyed my ability to produce videos, and I don't like it. But I digress. Now I'm back. So, why do we have direct sperm transfer if we have indirect methods that work just fine? And the connection to today's lecture is this very much relates to the evolution of sociality. No, it takes more, but that's a good, that's a really good argument. It actually takes more energy when we look at all the at different lineages, and we can see direct sperm transfer, intercourse or whatever you want to call it, but it's really direct sperm transfer, has evolved multiple, 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 multiple times. So the reason has to be very compelling. And this is what I know. It's not to prevent the sperm from drying out, because we know there's alternative solutions to that issue. The answer is paternity. If the male doesn't have assurance that it's his sperm that fertilized the female, evolutionarily he's dead. And females can get a lot of benefit. You get all those extra meals, you get the gifts, you can accumulate that stuff. In an evolutionary sense, seminal fluid is a good source of protein for some species, that's a deal breaker. All the other things, finding a habitat. There's a whole variety of things we can list that are associated with courtship behaviors that actually give the young a potential to survive. 
So if the female cheats, if you will, or, or has multiple suitors but only chooses one, it's, it's an evolutionary dead end for all the suitors who aren't chosen. So strong an evolutionary dead end that he positively wants to make sure it's his sperm. In, in other words, evolution acted to ensure that males are guaranteed their sperm fertilizes the egg. And so it's paternity, it's the need for males evolutionarily to be certain their sperm are fertilizing an egg that leads to direct sperm transfer. Again, I can turn to insects because they have some wonderful structures that illustrate this. Um, if I were worried, speaking anthropomorphically, but, but evolutionarily, if the problem was, if I mate with this female, but she has a mating system that's last in, first out, in other words, the last male to mate with her, that would be the sperm that fertilizes the eggs, and many species do. How might I ensure that it's my sperm? Obviously, I just don't stop mating with her. The obvious solution is or let go. The record for this, which is so long that it almost boggles any evolutionary explanation, occurs in tropical walking sticks, which remain in copula for something on the order of two or three months. Now, that's crazy. One, it doesn't take two or three months for the eggs to develop. Two, you have to be, you would think that two walking sticks hooked together would be a bigger target for predators. But apparently, we can, I can say this right off the bat, obviously there's huge competition among those males for females that you would have that, that behavior. Male guarding behavior, mate guarding behavior, excuse me, mate guarding behavior in which the males hover around the females, guard them and so forth, is extremely common among different animal species. Similarly, there can be an advantage for females to evolve a physiology where they only mate once. Why? Because you don't have a male on top of you for the rest of your life making sure it's his eggs, right? So there's an interesting interplay of evolutionary forces when you look at sexuality. And we, by looking at some of the extreme forms, we can get an insight into how severe certain pressures are in various species. In some groups of organisms, Essentially, all of the birds engage in sexual dimorphism, where the males are brightly colored, but that's not enough. They have to do these ridiculous dances or ridiculous calls or ri just ridiculous put whatever you want after it for the females to select them. And then, what does modern research show? Those bitches, they've been cheating the whole time anyway. Yeah, so a lot of the female birds, making the, after making the males go through this, are cheating anyway because they can get some material benefits from doing it, apparently. So, where does all this lead us when it comes to sociality? Everything is fine and dandy as long as you're separate. But once you have to have direct, sex, direct gamete transfer, you've got to find the female, you've got to go through all these communication steps, and you have to complete the deal. So even for a solitary species, you suddenly have all of these circumstances that require you to have some form of communication, and it also requires you to be able to have an interplay of behavior. What I'm arguing is those are what are called pre-adaptive traits. That when you have traits like that, it's easy to have selection operate on those traits. What traits? Communication. Finding other individuals. And what were they called again? The generic term's pre-adaptive. If you guys hold up your hand, the fact that we have a thumb over here is because our ancestors grabbed branches. But as many people have recognized, the fact that the thumb will meet with these fingers allows tool use. So this is the classic pre-adaptive trait. And I can give you an easy explanation without knowing that much about 
anthropology. I guarantee that if we look to the, the primate ancestors of humans, this thumb will not be as, as widely separated and it'll be more like a toe and it'll probably be more like this. And I guarantee evolution operated to do this. Because in the Higley opinion, tool use is what separates human beings from the other primates. And, and I'm, I'm sure that there must have been huge selection pressure on having more efficient hands. That's a classic pre-adaptive trait. A thumb didn't arise de novo. Um, it's the same reason all animals, you can find all, excuse me, all vertebrates, you can you find analogies between fins or bones because they all derive from the same structure. In contrast, insect wings do not. Uh, insect wings are not from an appendage. They arise directly out of the integument, the skin. Okay. It's interesting they spoke about sex because sex is also a reason, indeed the core reason, that probably underlies the evolution of sociality. It's controversial, but less so than once it was. And let me sort of finish today's lecture with a brief genetic argument that I'll pick up next time, okay? Let's look at what's called degree of relatedness. Before we do this, remember one thing. Evolution, the mechanics of evolution, do not act to preserve species. They don't even act to preserve a specific genome, assemblage of genes. They act on genes. Through time, it is individual genes that are selected for or against, and they're carried out. They're repackaged in different combinations, but the mechanics of evolution are such that certain genes survive a long time and other genes do not. We're all okay with that, right? That's like Bio 101 stuff. And the lack of feedback just makes me feel wonderful as an instructor. Moving on. My students constantly criticize, oh, where is it, down here? Amber gives me grief on this, okay. XY sex determination. The males and females both have two sets of chromosomes, right? Which means that their gametes have half one set. If we look at sisters, brothers, dads, and moms, we see that for, for sibs, and kind of ignore these two, I don't even know why they're in there, because I was copying and pasting. And I'll post this so you guys don't have to worry about copying it on. A sister gets half of her genes from dad and half of her genes from mom. She shares then, then one out of the two gametes. In relationship to her brother, who also gets half from each of these, but you don't know which half, it's essentially, essentially a quarter. So we see that sisters are related to each other by a quarter, and they're related to their parents by a half. You share half of your genes with your mom, half your genes with your dad, and a quarter of your genes on average with your sibs, on average. In the early 1900s, some biologists made an observation, and the observation that was this. In 12 out of 13 examples of sociality having evolved among insects, all 12 of those examples had one thing in common. They all had haplodiploid sex determination. Males are 1N, and females are 2N. There's nothing magical about XY. There's lots of ways for sex determination. 
as it happens in this lineage of insects. It's also not common among insects. It varies. How sex is determined among insects varies. What does it mean? It means that when the gametes are formed, the dad just gives up his whole genome. His, genome, his genes aren't half of his gametes. They're the whole thing. He just clones his genes and passes them on. The female, in contrast, cuts her genome in half. That means that the sisters have all of the genes that dad has, plus genes from mom. When you do the math, it means that they're only related to their brothers, as you might expect, by a quarter. The brothers are unrelated to their dads. They're only related to their mothers because the dad doesn't contribute anything. The female just splits her genes in half, and that's where males come from. But what becomes weird is when you consider the sisters. Whoops, here we go. Get all of the genes from dad, half the genes from mom, which means that they share 75% of their genes with their sisters. They are more closely related to their sisters. So what? And this is the big leap. Darwin had a huge amount of difficulty when he proposed the theory of evolution with explaining social insects. It had been a thorn in everybody's side because they engage in things that seem to run counter to evolutionary theory. In particular, how could you have ants constantly sacrificing themselves for the good of a colony? In fact, how could you even have sterile individuals involved? If you're sterile, you've given up the number one thing you have to have. And the insight that people had was that perhaps because the individuals are more closely related to each other, their genes are being ca carried on through their near relatives. In other words, perhaps you don't only have to spread your genes through your own reproduction. Perhaps if you share a lot of genes with your close relatives, their reproductive success is the same as your reproductive success. Because it's not your genome that matters, it's your genes. That's really no different than asking me what happens if a disease hits and all your offspring don't have much variability. It's the very same question. They all die and they're selected against. The really radical idea here is that it, once you accept the premise that it's the genes that don't matter, then you can also accept the premise that it may not be your own reproduction that matters. The term given to this is kin selection, K-I-N. And the argument is that selection could operate in such a way where your personal fitness is decreased. There was a corresponding or greater increase in the fitness of your close relatives. And what would be that fitness? It would be in direct proportion to how, what percentage of genes you share.